welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Once again, we're at that time of year where AMD is announcing a whole bunch of stuff at CES. Out of the three main hardware companies, AMD seem to generally be the most active at the show, which helps all of us enthusiasts kick off the year with a bit of excitement. As you can see, we're not at CES itself this year, but we've just finished watching AMD's press conference live stream, and we'll be recapping all the cool stuff they've showed off in case you missed it, plus a few things that they actually didn't show but provided us later. So yeah, if you want our thoughts on the show, this is where to get them. These events tend to go on for about an hour and they're filled with a bit of waffle as well, so having you know a 10 minute recap is probably not too bad. Anyway, let's start with the biggest announcement AMD made at the show, and that is Zen 2 APUs. Now, Zen 2 APUs will come in the form of two different product lines. We've got one for the desktops and another under Ryzen Mobile for laptops and other low power devices. However, for now, AMD is only talking about their mobile products. We didn't get any information about desktop APUs. Still, even if you aren't interested in in mobile parts, we are getting some hints at what will be brought to the desktop at a later date. Both should be using the same set of 7 nanometer hardware, just configured differently for the relevant products. So let's first talk about the die and the architecture. The bare bones we're seeing here is quite a bit different to AMD's Ryzen desktop processors. There's no IO die here. Instead, everything is built into the one piece of silicon on 7 nanometer, allowing the entire package to fit into a smaller area, which is crucial for compact devices like ultra thin laptops. So no chiplets here either. Some people thought AMD might swap out one of the chiplets die spaces on their desktop CPUs with a GPU die and call it a day, but no, this is entirely new silicon. But we're still getting significant gains over Zen Plus APUs. Ryzen APUs now have the capability to top out at 8 cores and 16 threads, which is split into two 4-core CCXs like on the desktop, but as I said, it's not in a chiplet, it's actually still in a monolithic die. This is a straight doubling of what was available in Zen and Zen Plus APUs, which featured up to 4 cores and 8 threads. And then and on top of that, we're getting all the additional benefits of AMD's Zen 2 design, like improved IMC, there is a larger cache, lower latencies, and a better memory controller LPDDR4X in this case. So on the CPU side, this is a substantial improvement for Ryzen APUs. It also means that in terms of CPU capabilities, there is much more crossover between Ryzen APUs and CPUs. With previous generations, the APUs occupied the lower core count parts in AMD's desktop lineup, up to four cores, for example, with GPU-less CPUs taking over at six cores and up. Now that Ryzen APUs have the ability to pack up to eight cores, we will have much much more crossover in the third generation with six and eight core options if those do come to the desktop at some point. What about the GPU capabilities? Well, we're not getting an upgrade to RDNA here. Instead, AMD is sticking with Vega. However, AMD says this is a highly optimized version of Vega with 59% more performance than the previous design. Some of that could be architecture. A lot of it could be from simply shrinking that down to seven nanometer. It is unclear exactly what the architectural differences are, but AMD isn't ready to bring their APU products up to RDNA just yet. The big question surrounding these APUs was how many GPU compute units are packed into the die? Well, that question has now been answered. There are eight compute units, although how many are unlocked will depend on the SKU. For a fully unlocked variant though, this is actually fewer cores than the 11 available with Zen Plus APUs. However, it's expected the eight we are getting are significantly more powerful and also they will be higher clocked. And it's clear that for these APUs, shifting to seven nanometers is a big deal. AMD is able to double the CPU cores and deliver a healthy bump for the GPU thanks to improved transistor density. And then on top of that, we get major efficiency improvements that will really help with power constrained products like Ryzen Mobile. Where AMD could be set to see the biggest gains are with the Ryzen Mobile parts, particularly in the 15 watt class where Intel are still very competitive with common Lake and Ice Lake. Well, from a pure specification perspective, Intel has really been blown apart here with these third gen APUs. This AMD are now offering eight cores in a 15 watt package. The most available in this sort of class previously was six cores with Comet Lake, or just four cores if you wanted Intel's beefier Gen 11 graphics in Ice Lake. AMD doesn't need two lineups to deliver top end CPU and GPU performance. They're combining both a powerful GPU and powerful CPU into the one product, and I think that will make it a really compelling option. Of course, it will depend on how performance stacks up and how many gains AMD have been able to achieve in power management, but the hardware alone should be far, 
far more competitive than any previous AMD product in this market. The 15 watt lineup stacks up as followed. There are five parts, starting with the four core, four thread Ryzen 3 4300U, then two Ryzen 5 parts, one with six cores and six threads, and one with six cores and 12 threads. Then up at the high end, we have two eight core parts, one with SMT and one without, same as Ryzen 5. Base clock speeds progressively decrease across this lineup, starting as high as 2.7 gigahertz for four cores, dropping down to 1.8 gigahertz with eight cores and SMT. But on the other hand, maximum clocks increase up to 4.2 gigahertz for the Ryzen 7 4800U. These clocks actually aren't too far away from Zen Plus APUs. The Ryzen 7 3700U, for example, was clocked at 2.3 gigahertz with a 4 gigahertz turbo. So the Ryzen 7 4800U is doubling cores, reducing the base clock, and actually increasing the turbo. So with IPC increases factored in, this should mean a large performance gain. GPU compute unit counts also vary depending on the model, with 8 at the high end and 5 on the lower end. Clock speeds are up to a whopping 1750 megahertz in the top end parts, well above what was achievable previously. AMD says this GPU in the 4800U is 28% faster than the GPU available in Intel's competing iSleek Core i7 1065G7 in 3D Mark, but it's the CPU improvements that are massive. 4% faster in Cinebench single thread and 90% faster in multi thread. Although in real world applications like the Adobe Suite, AMD is touting a more modest but still huge performance advantage of 40% or more. This should make it faster than even Intel's six core Comet Lake CPUs, although of course you also get the GPU advantages packed in here too. So this could be the best all round APU for both CPU and GPU performance in that 15 watt sort of class. Performance per watt is also significantly increased. 24% higher than first gen Ryzen Mobile, of which 70% comes from the switch to 7 nanometer and about 30% from IPC changes. There's also a higher performance line for mobile at 45 watts, which will compete with Intel's H series. Currently, Intel's parts in this market are still 9th gen, but we expect that to change in the coming months with 10th gen Comet Lake parts pushing up to these power envelopes. We don't know what those CPUs will bring yet exactly, but current parts are up to 8 cores, with the most popular variants being 6 cores. So AMD doesn't necessarily hold the core count crown here, but given their parts are on 7 nanometer compared to Intel on 14 nanometer, the efficiency battle should be well in AMD's favor, which for power constrained laptops should mean better performance. Again, we'll have to benchmark that to see how it stacks up. Here's the 45 watt lineup. Just two products here, the six core 12 thread Ryzen 5 4600H and the eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 4800H. Base clock speeds are much higher thanks to the increased 45 watt TDP, but boost clocks are, the, I guess, the same as the 15 watt lineup. We get a similar GPU configuration as well, so it's really just clock speeds that differentiate these parts from the lower power lineup. AMD says the Ryzen 7 4800H is faster than the Intel Core i7 9700K on the desktop for 3D Mark physics tests, which is very promising for gaming performance given these parts will be in gaming laptops. And of course, the 9700K is a 95 watt part, so AMD is claiming to do this with a much lower TDP. But at the same time, 3D Mark physics tests aren't really real world, so we'll have to explore how this chip fares in gaming. For content creators, these should also be a big jump in performance with the 4800H offering around 30% more performance than the 6 core Core i7 9750H in AMD's charts. However, Intel also has an 8 core CPU on the market, the Core i9 9980HK, so it's unclear how those parts compare. Still, given Ryzen's efficiency advantages, it's possible the 4800H will be able to offer this performance in smaller laptops and at a lower price, although we don't have any OEM pricing details for these chips at this point. The other thing you will have noticed is all these processors have Ryzen 4000 branding. So this begins the Ryzen 4000 series. It's a little confusing as these are technically third gen APUs using Zen 2, but it continues AMD's naming scheme where the APUs sit an architectural generation behind the CPUs in whatever the current series is. With Ryzen 3000, for example, we had Zen 2 CPUs and Zen Plus APUs. So we can expect Zen 3 CPUs to also launch in the Ryzen 4000 series later this year. 
AMD also talked about SmartShift for AMD's APUs, which allows a Ryzen APU to provide better performance when paired with a discrete GPU in both GPU and CPU applications. It sounds like this basically offloads all GPU tasks to the discrete GPU within milliseconds when necessary, and then pushes up CPU clocks a little bit to sustain better CPU performance, because of course there'll be a bit more TDP that could be allocated to the CPU in that APU part. Overall, this balance of power between the chips leads to a performance increase. AMD was touting 10 to 12% gains right now with SmartShift coming to laptops in Q2 2020. Oh, and all of these APUs support up to 64 gigabytes of LPDDR4X memory, bringing a pretty substantial gain to memory bandwidth, which helps both the CPU and the GPU. There are also some new Athlon APUs, but they're Zen, not Zen 2, so let's just skip over them very briefly. What about desktop parts? Well, we don't have any SKUs to share with you today, but you can clearly see what will happen on the desktop. Eight cores is a given and up to eight GPU compute units. And we can see clock speeds will be at least in the 4.2 gigahertz range for boost clocks. Now, there will be still some sacrifices, so don't expect 3700X level performance on the CPU and cache being one area where the smaller APU die hasn't been able to deliver as much as the desktop chips. But nevertheless, these APUs should still be quite powerful, at least compared to what was available previously. Okay, let's change gears now to talk about discrete GPUs, and this announcement won't come as a surprise to anyone that's been following the absolute deluge of leaks over the past few weeks. I'm talking about the Radeon RX 5600 XT, the new mid-range part that slots between the existing RX 5500 series and RX 5700 series in AMD's lineup. The specifications here have played out pretty much exactly as the leak suggested, 36 compute units for 2,304 stream processors, putting the compute unit count on the 56 600 XT on par with the 5700. There's even the same number of texture units and ROPs. However, the 5600 XT is clocked lower with a game clock of just 1375 MHz compared to 1625 MHz for the RX 5700. So immediately, we won't have as high shader performance from this new card despite the same core configuration. The other major changes to the memory, there is a cut down memory bus here, just 192 bits wide, connecting through to six gigabytes of GDDR6 with a 12 gigabits per second clock rate. This allows for 288 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth compared to 448 gigabytes per second for the 5700 series with its wider bus and higher memory clock. We've previously seen the RX 5700 cards be quite memory limited, so this is another factor that we'll see the RX 5600 XT perform below the RX 5700. Generally, the specs here do exceed the RX 5500 XT with 36 compute units compared to 22 and higher memory bandwidth thanks to a 192-bit bus compared to 128-bit. But we will be in the unusual position where AMD's cheaper mainstream card is available with a larger frame buffer. The 8GB RX 5500 XT isn't a great buy at $200, it's far too expensive for the performance it provides, but it does have the extra VRAM that the 6GB RX 5600 XT doesn't. The only mystery surrounding this card going into CES was the price. AMD thankfully did announce that the card will be priced at $279 and it will be available on January 21, ending that particular mystery. It's hard to say what this means for the card's value and cost per frame numbers without doing full performance testing, but it does put it in a head-to-head -head battle with Nvidia's GTX 1660 Ti, which is also priced at $279. AMD did show some brief performance numbers showing the RX 5600 XT outperforming the GTX 1660 Ti by 20%, but who knows whether this is truly representative of all games, so stay tuned for our benchmarks. They also showed a different set of numbers pitting the 5600 XT against the GTX 1660 Super OC, specifically the Gigabyte OC model, boasting a 15% performance advantage on average. It's interesting they'd show the 1660 Super OC as being faster than the GTX 1660 Ti. However, the two test systems used are different. The 1660 Ti is being tested on the Ryzen 7 3800X, while the 1660 Super is tested on the Core i9 9900K. So it sounds like the 1660 Super OC numbers are probably a bit more representative of the situation here, given we're less CPU limited, although marginally so on the 9900K. And it's an interesting chart to show. The 5600 XT will end up $30 more than the GTX 1660 Super Gigabyte OC variant, so 12% more in terms of cost for 15% more performance. However, other 1660 Supers are available for as low as $230, so this will be a really tight battle for which card delivers better value around the $250 price point, so stay tuned for our review, where of course we'll break all of that down. 
Meanwhile, it will come in cheaper than the RX 5700, although not by much as we have seen some flash sales of that card reach $300, while the cheapest AIB models right now are around $330. But hey, at least the RX 5600 XT isn't $300 like the rumors did suggest. It'd be a much harder sell if it were that $20 more. Oh, and there is also a 5600M and 5700M coming to mobile in the first half of 2020, but not much else was shared there. Let's wrap things up with a few tidbits. We got pricing and a release date for the Threadripper 3990X, AMD's 64-core workstation CPU they first announced back at the launch of the 24 and 32-core models. That chip will be priced at $3,990 and will be available on February 7th, perfect pricing given that part's name. This is actually Actually quite a decent price for the 3990X. I know a lot of people are saying $4,000 is a lot to spend on a single CPU, but it does put its cost per core in line with the $2,000 32-core Ryzen 9 3970X. Often these high-end workstation CPUs have a bit of a price premium as you increase and introduce more cores, so it wouldn't have been a surprise to see the 3990X come in at $4,200 or thereabouts. But for $3990, while definitely very expensive for a single CPU, it's not too bad considering what you get. And of course, this isn't a mainstream consumer part. This is for people that you know make a lot of money from their CPUs. Throwing $4,000 on something this powerful uh, isn't gonna be too bad for people that actually need a workstation CPU this powerful. We also got final specifications for this part, which include a 2.9 gigahertz base clock, 4.3 gigahertz maximum turbo clock, and 280 watt TDP. Clock speeds are a little down on the 32 core and 24 core models with a boost only reaching 4.3 gigahertz instead of 4.5 gigahertz but lower clocks are expected from such a high core count part we now have two FreeSync brands as well, with FreeSync Premium designating 120 plus hertz monitors with low frame rate compensation, and FreeSync Premium Pro also introducing HDR capabilities. This isn't necessarily a bad move, but it will depend on how stringent AMD certification process is, especially for HDR with that top tier. Oh, and something AMD didn't announce at the show, but is coming as well, is the Radeon RX 5600, which is a cut down version for OEMs, featuring 32 compute units instead of 36. Game clock remains the same, as does the memory configuration, but this presumably cheaper OEM model will still be a bit slower thanks to that cut down CU count. However, at this event, we didn't get any information about larger GPUs than AMD's RX 5700 XT. A lot of people have been eagerly awaiting information on Big Navi, which would compete with NVIDIA's high-end cards like the RTX 2080 Ti, but nothing has been shared so far. The focus of CES was mostly the APUs and the RX 5600 XT, and at this point, it sounds like Big Navi will be more of an RDNA 2 thing for the next generation. And this would make a lot of sense given the rumors surrounding the Xbox Series X and its use of a larger GPU die than the RX 5700 XT based on RDNA 2, at least that's what the rumors are suggesting. At this point, you'd think AMD is saving their big high-end comeback for when they have a refined RDNA architecture and hardware accelerated ray tracing. We also didn't get any word on Zen 3. It's still too early to be talking about AMD's next-gen CPU architecture given we aren't expecting any consumer parts using it for a while, and clearly AMD did not want to overshadow their Ryzen mobile announcements, which is still on Zen 2 and quite impressive. And that's all from AMD's CES 2020 press conference. We're hoping to have samples of the RX 5600 XT and the Threadripper 3990X shortly, and then we'll try and test Ryzen mobile as well when that filters through various laptop designs in the coming months. If you're enjoying our coverage of CES, well, this is really the first video we've done so far, you can subscribe, we'll have a couple more more news roundups throughout the rest of the show. Um, if you're interested in supporting the channel, you can of course support us on Patreon or through the merch store. Links to that are in the description below. Time to get editing this one. We'll get back to some more CS news shortly and we'll catch you in the next one.